Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of A Concise Chinese to English Dictionary for Lovers by Zhao Luo Guo. I don't know if I pronounced that right, I probably butchered it. I actually read an excerpt of this when I was reading the um, Vintage Mini Moderns box set. This was one of the, the books that there was an excerpt of, and I absolutely loved it. It was my favourite of the, uh, the box set. So I've been keeping my eyes peeled for a while now for this book, and I finally saw it, so I grabbed it. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... 23-year-old Zhuang, or Zed as she calls herself, Westerners cannot pronounce her name, arrives in London to spend a year learning English. Struggling to find her way in the city and through the puzzles of tense verb and adverb, she falls for an older Englishman and begins to realise that the landscape of love is an even trickier terrain. And um, yeah, I think that's one of the most interesting things of this is that it really does look at like the difference, differences in language and the differences in cultures. You're going to see as we go through. Uh, so my first tab here, the dedication. For the man who lost my manuscript in Copenhagen Airport and knows how a woman lost her language. Which I just think is a very cool little dedication. Um, and so I want to read you the prologue here because this gives you a great introduction to the writing style that's written in the kind of the vernacular with which uh, Zed speaks. So prologue, prologue, noun, introduction to a play or book. Now. Beijing time, 12 o'clock midnight. London time, 5 o'clock afternoon. But I at neither time zone, I on airplane, sitting on 25,000 kilometres above to earth and try and remember all English I learning in school. I not met you yet, you in future. Looking outside the massive sky, thinking air staffs need to set a special time zone for long distance airplanes, or passengers like me very confusing about time. When a body floating in air, which country she belonged to? People's Republic of China passport bending in my pocket. And so again, some of the, the differences in culture. Uh, room smelling old, rotten. Suddenly my body feeling old too. English people respect history, not like us, teachers say to us in schools. It's true. In China now, all buildings is no more than 10 years old and they already old enough to be demolished. And a little excerpt here I want to read to you guys. Um, I actually tabbed this twice because I like this point about social security and what they're taught in China. Um, and I love... The name of Big Stupid Clock and um, the posters that she talks about here. You will see as I read this excerpt. Walking around like a ghost, I see two rough mans in corner, suspicionly smoke and exchange something. Illegal, I have to run. Maybe they desperate drug addictors robbing my money. Even when I see a beggar sleeping in a sleep bag, I am scared. Eyes wide open in darkness, staring at me like angry cat. What are you doing here? I am taught everybody in West has social security and medical insurance, so why he needs begging? I going back quickly to Nuttingham House. Red old carpet, red old curtain, red old blanket. Better switch off light. Night long and lonely, staying nervously in tacky room. London should be like Emperor's City, but I cannot feel it. Noise coming from other room, laughing in drunkenly way. Upstairs, TV news people speaking intensely nonsense. Often the man shouting like mad in the street. I worry. I worry I'm getting lost and nobody in China can find me anymore. How am I finding important places including Buckingham Palace or Big Stupid Clock? I looking everywhere but not seeing big posters of David Beckham, Spicy Girls or President Margaret Thatcher. In China we hang in them everywhere. English person not respect their heroes or what? And uh, little her observations on baked beans here I agree with because I can't stand baked beans. What is this baked beans? White colour beans and orange sticky sweet sauce. I see some baked bean tins in shop when I arrived to London yesterday. Tin food is very expensive to China. Also we not knowing how to open it, so I never ever try tin food. Here right in front of me this baked beans must be very expensive. Delicacy is baked beans. Only problem is tastes like somebody put beans into mouth but spit out and back into plate. And then, again another uh, difference between Chinese language and English language. Chinese, we not having grammar. We saying things simple way. No verb change usage, no tense differences, no gender changes. We bosses of our language. But English language is boss of English user, which is probably true, you know? And she reads some Shakespeare and she, and she says, I'm not understanding at all what this tis executest and setest. Shakespeare can writing that, my spelling not too bad then. And um, the wait, she goes to a, she goes to a, like a rest, not a restaurant, like a cafe. And the waiter says, what would you like, still water or filthy water? What? Well, filthy water? I am shocked. Okay, filthy water. He leave and fetch bottle of water. I'm so curious about strange water. I opening bottle, immediately lots of bubbles coming out. How are they putting bubbles in water? Must be highly technical. I drinking it. Tastes bitter, very filthy, not natural at all, like poison. Yeah, I get the same with fizzy water. It's I don't like the taste of it. But I like fizzy drinks. And this is very true, and actually this is something here that I edit out when I'm editing books, because we write it like this, but you don't need to. 
People say, I'm going to go to the cinema. Why are there two go for one sentence? Why not enough to say one go to go? And you could, you could say, I'm, I'm going to the cinema. I'm going to go to the supermarket to buy some porks. You are going to go to the Oxford Circus to buy clothes. He is going to go to the park for a walk. I go is enough to expressing I am going to go, really. And it's very true. And she goes to the cinema and we have some um, little mini movie reviews here. Anyway, after breakfast at Tiffany, where posh woman dressing like prostitute and some like it hot where man is dressing like woman's, I go back to my new home which have cheap renting £65 per week. That's a pretty, you know, good way of describing those movies. I like this little bit, this reference to the one child policy. We actually have a few references to this. Uh, house is two floors, lived by Cantonese family, housewife, husband who work as chef in Chinatown, and 16 year old British accent son. It's like one child policy still carried on here. Great little couple of lines here. My body is crying for you, you say. Most beautiful sentence I heard in my life. We get a reference to the English patient, and uh, vegetarianism is covered as well, which is quite interesting for me as a vegan, so... Um, now I understand why I never buy a piece of meat. I thought it is because you're poor. Why don't eat meat? Meat very nutritious. You have no comments. Also, you'd be depression if you don't eating meat. You still have no comments. My parents beaten me if I don't eating meat or any food on table in a meal. My parents curse me being picky and spoiled because others dying without any food to eat. Still don't say anything. How come man is vegetarian? Unless he is monk, I say. Still no words from you, but laughing. And we learn that her lover, um, he is bisexual. And we get this, which I quite like as well. You look at me and you say, it's like the way you came into my life. I feel as if I am not naked anymore. I feel as if I am not naked anymore. That a beautiful sentence. And she's right, that is a beautiful sentence. And yeah, she ends up reading, a, well, she talks about how she read a porn magazine in a cafe, basically. You are surprised. I don't think you should read porn mags in a cafe. People will be shocked. I don't care. But you can't do that. You'll make other people feel embarrassed. And why they sell these magazines in every little corner shop is also even sold in the big supermarket. I believe everything to do with the sexuality is not shameful in West. Do what you like. The man next to us finishes his bacons, half naked woman photo with huge breasts still being exposed. I think I go now buy another poor magazine, I say, standing up. Okay, you do whatever you want, you say, shaking your head. This is hackney after all. People will forgive you for not being au fait with the nuances of British customs. We, um, he said, uh, the, the boyfriend, he says, Salam Alaikum to um, a, a woman. And she doesn't know what it means, so she's got, you say Salam Alaikum. Another new language for her to, to study. And again, another reference to the, to the one child policy, which I want to read out here. My mother had very bad temper. Maybe she hated me because I was a useless girl. She cannot have the second children because we have one child policy. Maybe that's why she beated me up. For her disappointment. Life to her was unfair too. She was beaten up by her mother for marrying my father. She was deprived of everything which belonged to her since she married him. And I just like this little bit here. I insert third pound. She is opening her legs, the legs of white jade. She smiles to everybody, even the place between her legs is smiling. Her garden is flirting with the world around it. She has a rosy garden, which two lips half open like waiting for the kiss. I never saw other woman's garden before. It shocks my eyes. I remember one day when you and me making love, you gave, you give me small mirror to reflect the place between my opening legs. That's your clitoris, you tell me. And she's thinking to herself, while I'm standing there watching, I desire to become prostitute. I won't be able to expose my body, to relieve my body, to take my body away from dictionary and grammar and sentences, to let my body break all disciplines. What a relief that prostitute not need to speak good English. She also not need to bring a dictionary with her all the time. And he asks her, her lover asks her, uh, what do you think heaven is like, assuming you think there is one? And she says, which heaven, Chinese heaven or Western heaven? And again, just some great writing throughout this. You tell me song is from Bette Midler, your favourite. You say you like the strong, rude women. You say all homosexual like Bette Midler, Mae West and Billie Holiday. But with Billie Holiday, not strong, she commit a suicide. And we learn a little bit about what he does for a living. Uh, you come back home in the dark without any energy left. Life suddenly becomes a bit boring. I find you're a physical man, a labourer, using your hands to survive. While lots of people in this world just need to use fingers to earn living by clicking computer keyboard. That would be me. And I quite like this, we learn uh, she discovers Frida Kahlo. I take out one a book from your shelf, Frida Kahlo, that Mexican woman artist. It is a picture album of her painting, her life and her terrible illness, being disabled after the bus accidents. So many self-portraits. 
I thought one painter only does one of these in his life, like one person only have one gravestone. But Frida Kahlo has so many self-portraits, as if she died many times in her life. There is one called self-portrait with necklace of thorns. She has the sharp and heavy eyebrow like two short knives, her eyes like black shining glass. She has the thick dark hair like a dark forest, the necklace of thorns climbing on her neck. There is a black monkey and black cat sitting on her shoulder. The impression on her face is so strong. I learned that she had to plant metal in her body so that to support her survive from disable. I feel my heart is being penetrated by the thorn she painted. I feel painful. Oh, and um, he gives her a birthday gift. The Happy Prince and Other Tales by Oscar Wilde, which funnily enough I recently read like a week ago. Um, you say it's a good book for me to start with to understand English writing easily. The second one is To the Lighthouse by A. Virginia Woolf. You say it can be read later on when my English becomes very good. And then uh, her friend Yoko gives her a vibrator. We get the line, humour is a Western concept. And um, Zed says, enjoy sex is a Western concept too. So she has an argument with her lover. Um, thinking about it, I don't know if we ever learn the name of her lover, but anyway, she has an argument with him because he's vegetarian. And he says, well, you are the enemy of animals. How many animals do you think you've killed in your life? You fight poison with poison. Eating animals is the human nature. In the forest, tiger eats rabbit, lion eats deer. That's how the nature works. That's how my teacher said in my middle school. But you Chinese eat anything, even endangered species. I bet if dinosaurs roamed the forests of China, someone would want to see what dinosaur meat tasted like. How come you people have no sense of protecting nature? But what is so different of eating plants? Everything has its life. If you were so pure, why not just stop eating so you can have no shit? You're impossible to talk to. You stand up leaving the dinner table. Okay, well let's tackle those two arguments. So that's how nature works. Yes, but we are the only animal that has a sense of conscience. We're the only animal that has a choice about what we eat and we can exercise that choice. If you want to consider that you're no different to a lion or whatever, then that is your prerogative, I suppose. It just means that you think that you are not an intelligent creature. Um, and then in terms of why not, uh, what about eating plants? That's the old argument. Uh, plants feel pain. Even if you take that to be true, eating meat, you have to filter all of the plants through the animal. So you're eating more plants than you would, plus the animal on top of it as well. Yes, you could sit there and eat nothing. That is an argument I've heard. If you care that much about the environment, you should just kill yourself. Um, there is actually some logic to that argument, although then I would argue, well actually the best thing to do is to go out and kill as many other people as you can and then kill yourself. So, I'm not going to do that because I don't, I'm non-violent. Ahimsa, got my Ahimsa tattoo. But if you want to make that argument because you love meat, go ahead, I guess. Anyway, um, she finished, we, we talk about some of her books here. Um, and I just think this is quite an interesting paragraph. Again, these are two books that I've read. I read the Oscar Wilde one quite recently. I tried to be quiet with you in the house. I have been reading books you gave to me. I quickly finished Oscar Wilde's The Happy Prince and Other Tales. I love the Nightingale story. It was so sad. Nightingales love not being valued by the prince at all. Why beautiful story always is sad. And I love the selfish giant who has a huge garden too, but the last sentence made me cry. It goes like this, and when the children ran in that afternoon, they found the giant lying dead under the tree, all covered with white blossoms. I start reading to the lighthouse. You are right, it is quite difficult for me. On the back it says it is about a middle-aged woman with her eight children in a summer house. Eight children without any husband. Gosh, it must be a hard book. I hold in breath while read the first page. I can't breathe freely because there are hardly full stops. Virginia Woolf must be a very wordy person. The writing is so forceful, it nearly painful for me to read. I suddenly understand that you must be suffered a lot from me because I am so forceful and demanding on words too. And even worse, you were forced to listen to my messy English every single moment. You are unlucky to be my lover. Well, this is the, th the interesting thing, is that I found her quite a likeable character to begin with. And as the thing goes on, she annoyed me more and more. And I get the impression that's what happened with her lover as well. And we get this. You point the ad of Donnie Darko in the paper and ask me, have you seen this film? The teacher and it says to Donnie, you are not an atheist, you're an agnostic. I think you're an agnostic too. Donnie Darko is one of my favourite films and I don't remember that bit. So anyway, then she uh, travels around Europe and I found the bits in Europe to be a little less interesting but I understand why they were there in terms of the book kind of needed them, you know. I thought English is a strange language. Now I think French is even more strange. In France, their fish is poisson, their bread is pain and their pancake is crepe. Pain and poison and crap, that's what they have every day. And she goes off to, uh, to Holland next and she says, 
I don't know anything about Holland, and I even didn't know Holland, Dutch, the Netherland, meaning the same place. Why a country have so many different names? Before I thought these three spread somewhere differently in Europe. And I thought this was um, quite, quite true, you know? A big train station is a bleak place. This station is bigger than any station in London. Waterloo Station, King Cross Station are just too normal compared with this one. Travel alone makes me feel sad when I see all these couples hold each other's hand and wait patiently. One thing to add as well is her English does get better throughout the story, which is quite interesting. Um, not quite to fluent you know, levels, there are still mistakes, but there are fewer mistakes. Um, she goes to Germany, she meets a German guy who ends up being ill, and she goes, I don't know which number I should dial, 999, 911, 221, 123. Is Berlin system like London or China? And it's funny because that's one of the things I normally look up when I uh, travel abroad to see what their emergency number is. She meets somebody who says that his job is an avocado. To be fair, he is Italian, so maybe that's the Italian term for it. But yeah, we get avocado, I'm surprised to hear. Is a fruit also a job? Please explain me, I ask. If you're gonna be put into prison, you can hire me to help you in the court, he says. Ah, he's like a lawyer. Yes, yes, avocado is lawyer. He is pleased that I understand. So she goes off to Portugal and she says they got a real sun here in their sky, not like in England. English sun is a fake sun, a literature sun, which I quite liked. Uh, and then there wasn't anything left from her travels that I wanted to add, but then she heads back to uh, England, meets up with her lover again. And we have some musing on age, which is interesting because uh, she is a lot younger than her lover is, uh, which is kind of the, what I have going in my relationship. I am the older one by 14 years. 14, yeah, 14 years. Today, when you unload some box from your van, you become extremely tired. You become really old. We used to look like five years difference in other people's eyes, but now obvious 20 years gap between us. This makes me feel a little sad about you. You look at me, a small smile. There is a shadow underneath your eyes. Maybe it is me made you old. I not go out, earn, live. And I always demand love from you. I demand love by showing my vulnerability again and again. I remember at the beginning of us, you have a perfect hair, but now there is a bit gray hidden behind your ears and your wrinkles there at the corner of your eyes. Sometimes I wonder if you saw these wrinkles, if you saw your gray hair hidden behind your ears. Oh, so here we have um, differences between pessimists and optimists. So we start with the definition. Pessimism, a tendency to expect the worst in all things. Optimism, tendency to make the most hopeful view. And she writes, a petal is a pessimist, a petal will fade away. An old man's body is a pessimist, things are rotten and falling apart. A Buddhist is a pessimist in his reality, but in the end when he faces his death he is an optimist because he is prepared for whole life to welcome the peace of death. A farmer is an optimist because he believes the potatoes will come out underneath the soil. A fisherman is an optimist because he knows whatever how far he fishes he will come back with his boat full of fish. A pesticide is an optimist, it means sustain the good life by killing bad life. Everyone tries to be an optimist, but being an optimist is a bit boring and not honest. Losers are more interesting than winners, um, which is very true. It's like that old saying that I think, I think Kurt Cobain said it, but I'm sure it's a popular thing to have said, which is that it's more interesting to write about things that are broken and falling apart than it is about things that are perfect. Um, so yes, some interesting stuff there. And also you can note by this point how much better, better her English has become throughout as well, which is quite cool. Now this is interesting because this kind of gets a little bit meta where she's, um, well you will see, but bear in mind that you're reading this as a book that's written from her point of view. I'd like to dedicate my life to do something serious, maybe things like writing or painting, but definitely not making shoes. I don't care what you said about artists. I'd like to write about you one day. I'd like to write about this country. People say one should separate one's real life from one's artwork, and one should protect his real life from his fiction life, so one can have less pain and be able to see the world soberly. But I think it is a very selfish attitude. I like what Flaubert said about Greeks. If you are a real artist, everything in your life is part of your art. The art is a memorial of the life. Art is the abstract way of his daily existence. Again, the Buddhist in my grandmother's voice tells me, the reality that surrounds us is not real. It is the illusion of life. Ah, but as uh, um, Leonard Cohen said, if your life is burning well, poetry is just the ash. Poetry is the evidence of life. So maybe life is not an illusion. Oh, anyway, uh, Concise Chinese to English Dictionary for Lovers by Zhao Lu Guo. Uh, I gave this a pretty strong five out of five. Um, I do think the beginning half is stronger than the second half, but I love the development, both in terms of the character development. I love the way that her language improves throughout as well. Um, it's just a really, really satisfying novel to read, you know. It's just one of those books where I didn't want it to end, and, and now that it has, I'm kind of sad. Um, it is certainly my top book of the quarter, and it is on track to be maybe the top book of the year. I don't know what my top books of the other quarters were. Um, but yes, 
There we go. So there you have it. That's what I made of a concise Chinese to English dictionary for lovers by Zhao Lu Guo. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.